custody. A chain of custody is actually the way you document and preserve evidence from the time that you actually started the cyber forensics investigation to the time that the actual evidence is presented at court or you know even internally within the organization to determine what actually happened, right? And, and even perform some type of attribution. Now, it is extremely important that you be able to show clear documentation of, you know, everything that you did whenever you documented, collected evidence and preserved that evidence, right? Uh, that includes how the evidence was collected, again, um, you know, when it was actually collected, how it was transported, how it was tracked, how it was stored, and who had access to the evidence and how it was actually accessed, right? Now, if you fail to maintain proper chain of custody, it is likely that you cannot use that evidence in court. And it is also important to know that how to uh, delete or dispose uh, evidence after an investigation, right? So when you collect evidence, you must, you know, must first protect it and protect its integrity, right? This involves making sure that nothing is added to the evidence and that nothing is actually deleted or destroyed. Um, and this is all known as evidence preservation, right? Now, a method used for evidence preservation is actually to only work with a copy of the evidence. Uh, in other words, not directly copying with the actual evidence itself, right? So as we uh, cover in earlier lessons, this involves uh, creating an image of a hard drive or any storage device that you actually are collecting the evidence from. Now, there are several forensic tools available in the market, as we mentioned before. You know, these are a couple of uh, most popular tools. Um, end case, um, which we uh, had before, and also access data forensic tools, another one, right, that that, uh, that can also help you collect evidence. So uh, throughout the course, you know, I'll give you some examples. Of course, some of these are commercial tools, but just some examples for you to actually become familiar with, right? Now, another methodology used in evidence preservation is actually to use a right protected storage device, right? In other words, that the storage device that you're investigating or using uh, should immediately be right protected before it's actually imaged and it should be labeled to include, you know, several things like the investigator's name, the date when the image was actually created, and the case name and number, if applicable, you know, in the case of a a case uh, investigation, and you may, you may actually have an identifier for that specific case, right? Now, you also must prevent electronic static or any other discharge from damaging or erasing the data, right? So special evidence bags uh, are, you know, anti-static bags that are, can be used to store digital, you know, devices and digital evidence, right? This is very important uh, because you have to actually prevent electric, electrostatic discharge or ESD and any other, you know, electrical discharges from damaging your evidence. Some organizations even have a cyber forensics labs, right, that control access to only authorized users and investigators. One method often used involves construction, what we call a Faraday cage, right? And this is a cage that is uh, often built out of a mesh conducting material that actually prevents electromagnetic energy from entering into uh, the cage and also escaping from that cage. And this actually prevents devices from communicating via things like Wi-Fi or cellular signals and, you know, any of the other type of communications, electronic communications, right? Transporting the evidence to the forensics lab or any other place, uh, you know, including the courthouse, uh, has to be done very, very carefully, right? So it is critical that the chain of custody, right, uh, and evidence preservation uh, be maintained during the transport of that evidence, right? So whenever you transport the evidence, you should strive to secure it in a lockable container, right? Uh, somewhere that actually, you know, the uh, any other person actually cannot access, right? Security forensics is attribution of assets and threat actors. So again, not only attribution to who actually performed uh, the, the security incident or the attack, but also what systems were involved, right? Uh, so then you can do further attribution to the threat actor. Now, there's definitely an undeniable motivation to support an evidence-led approach to cybersecurity forensics to achieve good attribution. 
Now, a suspect-led approach is actually often biased to the disadvantage of those being investigated. And this is due to the large number of technical complexities, and it is often impractical for cybersecurity forensics experts to be able to determine fully the reliability of endpoints, also the reliability of servers and network infrastructure devices, and subsequently actually to provide assurance to the court or you know to the entity that is investigating the the issue about the actual soundness of the processes involved and complete attribution to a threat actor. Right now, the forensics expert needs to ensure that no parts of the examination process were overlooked or repetitive. Also, cybersecurity forensic experts are often confronted with the inefficacy of traditional security processes in systems and networks designed to preserve documents and network functionality, especially since most systems are not designed to enhance digital evidence recovery. Now, there's a need for appropriate cybersecurity forensics tools, including software imaging, like we mentioned before, and also the indexing of the you know large data sets in order to successfully reconstruct an attack and attribute such attack to an asset or to a threat actor. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that traditional data forensics tools are typically designed to obtain the lowest hanging fruit and encourage security professionals to actually look for the evidence that is easier uh, or the easiest evidence to be identified and to be recovered. Now, often these tools do not have the capabilities to even recognize uh, other less obvious evidence, right? So that's the one of the considerations that you actually have to keep in mind when selecting a cyber uh, forensics tool. Now, during the cybersecurity investigation, the forensics expert may revisit portions of the evidence to actually determine its validity, right? Now, as a result, it may require additional investigations uh, and, you know, further investigation within uh, your environment. Now, this often can be a tedious process, right? And in some cases, the complexity of the network and the time required for the investigation can affect the e efficacy of the cybersecurity forensics professional to actually reconstruct and also to provide an accurate interpretation of that evidence. Now, from a practical and a realistic um, a perspective, the amount of time and effort involved in digital forensic process should pass the acceptable, um, you know, reasonable uh, test. In other words, that all efforts should not be put into finding every single conceivable trace of evidence and analyzing it, right? I mean, you're never going to be able to actually do that, and you will never be able to scale. And this is especially becoming more challenging to the cybersecurity forensics expert as the volume of data uh, to be analyzed becomes extremely big, right? Nowadays, with you know, a big data and big data analytics, this is actually a, a challenge. Now, evidence in cybersecurity investigations that go to court uh, is used uh, to prove or disprove facts that are, you know, in dispute, you know, and, and of course, as well as proving the credibility of the disputed facts, right? So, in particular, uh, circumstantial evidence or indirect evidence, um, you know, is, is one of the facts that, you know, that comes in, in, into play, right? Now, digital forensics evidence provides implications and extrapolations that may assist in providing some key facts uh, to that case, right? And uh, that evidence helps uh, the legal teams and the courts to develop reliable hypotheses or theories uh, to the committer of the crime or the uh, threat actor, right? Now, the reliability of the evidence is vital, right? again, it's crucial to supporting or uh, refuting any type of hypothesis uh, put forward during the attribution of a threat actor, right? So these are really important things that I'm, you know, of course, repeating through the course uh, because they are crucial for evidence collection, evidence preservation, and for you to be able to um, be successful in front of a court, right, and in front of a judge.
A host-based intrusion detection system, or HIDS, is an intrusion detection system that monitors and analyzes the operations, programs, processes, and the network transactions of a host, right? So this is similar to the network-based IDS, but in this case, installed on a host. There are many different tools that monitor dynamic system behaviors in the form of antivirus right, packages or antivirus softwares. And while these antivirus softwares often also monitor system states, they actually do not spend a lot of time looking at who is actually doing what inside of a computer and whether a program should or should not have access to a particular system resource, right? So, for example, a host intrusion detection software or system it can protect against buffer overflows attacks on a system memory, right? And also can enforce security policies while they actually antivirus software, they do not do this, right? They, they cannot protect against a buffer overflow attacks unless they actually have a signature that there's some malware that is actually exploiting that, right? But they cannot dynamically just detect a buffer overflow attacks, uh, and you know that's just an example. But you know things things like that in a system, right? So a host intrusion detection system can also monitor the state of programs, memory, processes, and services in a system, and also any modifications to that system, right? So ideally, a host intrusion detection system works in conjunction with a network uh, counterpart, so a network IDS or network IPS, so that the um, you know, host intrusion detection system can find anything that actually slips past the network counterpart, so the network IPS or the network IDS. Um, now, since in today's environment, a lot of users are actually mobile users, not all the times they're actually protected by network IDS or an IPS systems, and that's why, you know, folks actually install a host IDS on systems, right? So it's kind of like part of the defense in-depth strategy where you not only have you know the network-based components, but you also install software in the host of the of, of the end user, right? So a host intrusion detection system uses a database. Um, it's called the object database, and this is a system of objects that it should actually monitor, right? So usually, um, but not necessarily, you know, the file system objects. Um, are included into that database, right? So a host intrusion detection system will also check that appropriate regions of memory have not been modified by, you know, an attacker or or malware in this case, right? So uh, computer systems generally have many dynamic and frequently changing objects which intruders want to actually modify. And this is what a host intrusion detection system should actually monitor, right? Uh, now, these systems or these uh, host IDS, IDS systems employ different other, you know, detection techniques like monitoring, you know, changing file attributes, uh, also, you know, monitoring log files that actually have decreased in size since they were actually last checked, right? And several other means to detect unusual events as well. You learn the details about what are viruses, what are malware, the different types of malware and different type of viruses, and also how network and host antivirus technologies actually work, right? In this lesson, we'll quickly review how host antivirus and host uh, anti-malware um, software, specifically their logs, how can they actually be consumed for the purpose of security monitoring, right? So, of course, you can review the logs uh, of your antivirus software, uh, like I'm actually showing here, you know, in your own machine. But in an enterprise, an administrator can actually just not log into each system and review these logs, right? So that will not scale. Now, these need to be managed in a systematic and in a lot more efficient way. So in a lot more centralized uh, way, right? So one important aspect of security management is to consider the relative placement and interaction of antivirus products, uh, also with other tools, you know, adjunct tools and processes within the context of a defense in depth strategy, just like we learned in, you know, previous lessons. Now you should identify different layers of defense in depth uh, and where to install antivirus and anti-malware solutions, right? Uh, things like, you know, the internet visible platforms or, you know, servers, uh, content scanning servers as well, 
uh, email servers, file and application servers, um, desktop, laptops, workstations, and mobile devices, right? So most antivirus functions typically focus on scanning the content of messages and files, right? Uh, primarily those exchanged with the public internet, right? But they also address malware in the form of active local content, right? You can also deploy network antivirus to process email attachments, scanning email text for questionable content, usually for spam, uh, but also perhaps as part of a security investigation that you may have in your environment. And of course, you know, this is actually done to identify spam base uh, on email content and malware and, you know, any other type of malicious content. Now, you can also scan outbound traffic from an organization's web and FTP server or users' file transmissions, right? Uh, there are other areas besides just the placement and the configuration of antivirus security technologies, right? Um, you actually have to uh, take a look at the deployment uh, personnel that need to you know, be able to plan, organize, and control the administration and maintenance of the antivirus technologies. Also, also the, the operational context of the antivirus configuration and the use of management data about the effectiveness uh, or uh, uh, you know efficiency of the antivirus configuration, right? You also need to keep in mind that you need to manage the antivirus products, right? This typically uh, means uh, in you know distributing virus signatures or scanning engines. Uh, updates of the system itself, right? Uh, given the increased amount of uh, virus activity, you know, weekly updates seem appropriate for most locations. In some cases, actually, it will be, um, you know, daily updates or, you know, multiple times a day, right? Uh, depending on, on the environment and depending on the distribution, right? So uh, before distribution, you should always examine the new testing signatures, files, or scanning engines updates, right? And in most cases, actually, this is actually you know, already done by the actual vendor itself, right? So by the antivirus vendors, and in a lot of cases, actually by the backend technology for that uh, antivirus solutions in, in an enterprise uh, environment. Now, in some cases, this actually can be inefficient or too late since new variants of malware are actually created uh, every day. This is why newer technologies like the Cisco AMP for endpoints make antivirus software a little obsolete, right? So uh, since they can actually go beyond the typical signatures uh, and use cyber threat intelligence to detect threats before they infect the system, but they can also perform analysis after a system actually has been compromised and look for things like, you know, file trajectory, you know, retrospective analysis and a device trajectory as well, right? Now, in large organizations, you must deploy and configure antivirus monitoring solutions. The benefits of using the antivirus monitoring solutions include focusing on antivirus events that need action, right? So you can actually prioritize those events within your organization, visualizing, you know, virus outbreaks events within your environment uh, on your network, monitoring virus activities on, you know, critical assets, also receiving notifications and creating cases on selective, you know, virus events, right? So creating a cases so, you know, your investigators or, you know, your personnel can actually investigate, you know, those uh, virus events. Uh, also monitoring the health of your antivirus servers, drilling down on, you know, virus infection details and reporting on health of the actual antivirus agents installed on the machines themselves as well. Nowadays come with a built-in firewall, uh, and also there are actually several commercial, personal, or host-based firewall solutions in the market. Uh, so uh, one, one thing to highlight is actually, in some cases, the host-based firewalls are also uh, called personal firewalls, right? So now Mac OS X uh, comes with a built-in firewall, and that's what I'm actually showing it here, where you can restrict what applications can actually do and how they can actually communicate in the network, right? So. Windows also come with a built-in firewall. In Windows, you can actually go to the control panel and systems and security, and then Windows firewall. And of course, depending on the Windows uh, version um, and the operating system, um, you know this is actually configured in different ways. Uh, you can actually you know select to either turn it on or turn it off, or you, in some cases, actually you may be asked for the administrator password 
to actually you know do that. Uh, now Linux also has a host-based firewall that is called IP tables, and basically IP table is a command line utility for configuring Linux kernel firewall uh, implementations, uh, which actually was originally implemented within the NetFilter project, right? The term IP table is also commonly used to refer to this kernel level firewall, right? So uh, now IP table can be configured directly with, you know, the IP tables command or by using one of the many front ends and uh, graphical unit interfaces or GUIs, you know, out there. Um, one thing to highlight is actually IP tables is used for IPv4 okay. and then IP6 tables is used for, for IPv, or IPv6, right? Now, IP table contains five tables, right? Raw, filter, NAT, mangle, and security. Raw is used only for configuring packets so that they are exempt from connection tracking. Filter is the default table, and this is where all the actions typically associated with a firewall take place, right? Uh, NAT is actually used for network address translation, and, uh, you know, both for static network address translation, one-to-one -one translation, and also for port forwarding as well. Mangle is actually used for specialized packet uh, alterations, and security is used for mandatory access control networking rules, uh, specifically in things like uh, SE Linux, uh, for example, right? So now tables uh, consist of chains, and uh, chains are list of rules which are followed in, in a specific order, right? So the default table or a filter contains three built-in chains, input, output, and forward. And these are uh, activated at different points of the packet uh, filtering process. Now, the packet filtering is based on rules which are sp specified by multiple matches and one target. And basically, matches are the conditions the packet must satisfy so that the rule can be applied. And the target is the action uh, taken when the packet actually matches all those conditions, right? You can uh, send IP table, you know, logs to external syslog servers and, you know, to external entities as well, right? So logs from personal uh, or host-based firewalls are important and should be, you know, managed in a centralized way in enterprise networks, right? So it is fairly inefficient to actually go to every single host and look at the logs, you know, themselves. And that's where, you know, solutions like Splunk and many others out there can help with identification and mitigation of threats detected by these host-based firewall uh, logs and, you know, organize them and be able to actually search them in a more uh, efficient manner.